get going. All right, welcome everybody to the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources first spring 2019 webinar. Today we are going to be talking about faculty OER adoption stories in art history and US history. Um, and we have um, a couple different faculty members here prepared to share that with us. We do look forward to uh, some questions. If you have any questions throughout this, uh, feel free to write them in the chat window and um, we'll try to keep track of those and uh, bring those questions to the faculty. So the first thing we'll do is uh, start off with a few introductions as we've already uh, been doing that in the chat here. If you want to say you know, where you're from and let us know, uh, let, every, let all the rest of the participants know who you are, please do so in the chat window there. Before we move on to our speakers today, our guest speakers, Dr. Rudy Navarro, um, art history instructor at Phoenix Community College in Maricopa County, Arizona. It's one of the Maricopa County Community Colleges. Um, and Laura Baltz, who is a U.S. history instructor at uh, Pierce College District in Washington. And the moderators for today's webinar are myself, Matthew Bloom. I am the Open Educational Resources Coordinator for the Maricopa County Community College District. Um, and with me here is the director of the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, Una Daly. And Una, did you want to say a little bit about the mission of CCC OER? Uh, um, uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, um, welcome everybody. Uh, glad you could join us today. Um, and um, CCC OER has been around for about 11 and a half years now. And um, we're just thrilled to keep on growing, um, helping to grow open education at community colleges. And our mission uh, is uh, not really changed uh, since we were founded, although so many things have changed within the environment. Um, there is so much more OER out there. There are so many more people developing it. And this webinar series is part of the work that we do to support faculty in finding high quality OER and developing it. And at the heart of our work is improving student success. And um, Matthew, if you just want to click to the next slide, um, I'll just say one last thing. We uh, celebrated our 80th member uh, joining us, uh, I think, just last week. And I do want to welcome our new members that just came in within the last month. And uh, I'll start with the in reverse order the Colorado Community Colleges um, just joined us last month so welcome to them. Uh, we also had um, Johnson County Community Colleges in Kansas which is our first community college in Kansas to join us so welcome to them and um, last but not least the amazing Santa Ana College in Southern California who has been a long time um, collaborator with us and just joined us as a member. So thank you Matthew. Yes, thank you very much, Una. And um, so what we did was we thought up a few questions. We, we wanted to try to get um, the perspectives and, and experiences from some people who were kind of new to adopting open educational resources. So we reached out and we, we found um, our speakers today who I've already introduced and we thought about a number of questions. Th these are a lot of questions here and um, they're not necessarily going to answer every single one of them directly, but some of the, the types of things we were hoping that they would share with us uh, were their motivation for adopting OER for the course in the first place, uh, the process for doing the work, how did the college make it easier, uh, what did the college, um, what did they wish that the college could have done for them? How did it change your teaching? What was the student response and did you measure it? Um, and what do you think you might change in the future? So we're looking for a, a number of different things here and I'm, I think that you'll be pretty pleased with the experiences that we're sharing here. So I'm gonna go ahead and start here um, by introducing once again, Laura Baltz, US History Instructor at Pierce College. And she's going to tell you about her experience with OER adoption in US history. Hi, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, and let me share my slides with all of you. Okay. So sorry. Okay, so um, my motivation originally for 
uh, using OER was our community college went to an, a, a newer system and we had uh, basically it kind of messed up financial aid and so I had a bunch of students that couldn't afford their textbook and so I started looking for other resources and started really talking about producing or using more OER. So um, my, part of it was just to help students in their financial need so that, you know, they were being able to keep up with the course content. So um, originally, uh, some of my initial concerns right out of the gate were, um, do I have to write all of my material myself? And I thought, I, I don't know if I can do all of that. Um, I wasn't sure if that was a part of it, but, and I didn't realize at the time that, you know, there's tons of core text you can find. So if you're worried about that, you know, don't worry. There's plenty out there. Uh, I didn't know how to do attributions, which I kind of know how to do them. I'm, I'm brand new to this whole thing. So this is my first quarter using OER. So uh, I, we're working on, um, I'm still working on developing stuff. So I'm, you know, learning how to do attributions. And of course, uh, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work, but planning in and of itself is a lot of work, right? Um, so th those were my initial concerns right out of the gate. How, when and how am I gonna get it done and teach at the same time? Uh, and so uh, luckily I had a, a wonderful, wonderful instructional design team that, uh, that I had here at Pierce who I more, were more than willing to give me any resources I wanted help me in any way, shape, or form I could. Um, so if you're thinking like, why should I adopt OER? Um, some of the obstacles are, how do I find good resources? I would suggest starting with a core text. If you're, if you're teaching a history, psychology, sociology, you, there, are, there really are a lot of core texts that you can start with. You don't have to write everything yourself and think, oh my gosh, am I, basically writing an online text. No, there's, I use um, the U.S. history course uh, from OpenStax, the book from OpenStax, uh, which is actually really good and hits all the learning targets and things that I would have uh, wanted to look for in a book. So make sure if you think, well, how, how would I even begin? Ask your instructional design team, and I'm sure they can help you find them. Um, and, you know, how do I find good resources? Uh, you well, there, once again, you know, if you have a good instructional design team, you know, you want to look for things that are going to uh, have longevity. So I'm sure uh, all, anybody who's worked with OER knows that stuff disappears. If you don't find stuff that um, we've looked at stuff and there's certain resources that, you know, a organization will decide we'd like to get paid for this. And so it disappears or they want some kind of, you know, money to go with that. So finding good resources that are also, um, that will last, okay? Uh, and then writing great assessments and obviously the time, but the solutions for all that is a really good instructional design team. Don't be afraid to ask as many questions as you um, you want. I, if, even if you think it's a dumb question, it usually isn't, they'll answer it for you. I also have two, a couple of really incredible um, resource librarians. If I get stuck and I'm like, I need this document and I can't find it uh, open, help it, within got less than a day, I usually have somebody goes that will email me back and go, here you go, I've got one. Um, we've also used students. We had a student employee and he was wonderful and I could send him anything and he would transcribe it for me um, because when you're looking at early uh, primary source documents, it's not always easy to find that stuff. Uh, and so I, I had documents, but they weren't open and he transcribed them pretty quick and got them back to me. Um, and I also, uh, we've, I've designed a couple of assignments within my classes and I'll have to get back to everybody on how it goes. Uh, and then with the incentive of if it's really, really good, they get extra credit and I get to use it. We can use it to, you know, use it in for other classes. So don't think that you have to do it all yourself and write it all yourself. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to um, any of your instructional design team, resource librarians. They're usually more than willing to help. Um, I'll give yourself a timetable. I tried to 
do, I, I tried to take it one module at a time, uh, one subject at a time, and really think, okay, what are my learning targets? What do I want them to get out of this? What's realistic? Because with history, you can overload people with primary source documents. And I thought, well, I we don't want to do that. I want them to read the main text. And so I had to be cautious of, you know, which texts I was picking and which primary, primary source documents I was um, using. Um, but give yourself a, some, some a timetable or chunk it out, like do one subject at a time. If you try, my, in my experience, if I try to look at the whole cl the class as a whole and start working, it gets a little overwhelming really, really quick. So I settle on one topic at one specific time and say I'm going to do um, the New England colonies and then go, go for broke until we felt that it was good. This is just an example of one of the chapters out of OpenStax. So it's, I mean, I, I really enjoy, the more I get into the, t the, um, the textbook, I am loving everything about it. It, because in, in each of these um, little links, you'll find it has a glossary and it has a, a little review question section at the bottom. So if you have students with, um, that struggle with reading, sometimes it helps to give them vocab and it's built into this. Um, and then obviously we, I came up with the, the discussion board about Native Americans and settlers and things like that. But this is just an example of what it looks like. Uh, this is just one chapter. And you can add to this the Foundations for English Success. I added the game and the, um, and the discussion board was mine too. And the good thing about this too is that you, get, you can build in rubrics. And so it's definitely streamlines a lot of my grading. I found that this quarter my grading has become a lot easier. Okay, how to support the adoption of OER? Um, obviously, grants and monetary compensation. Um, if you're, I mean, it's, I, I personally did a lot of my work over the summer. I kind of, I, right now I'm teaching 21 credits and so I'm not having the opportunity to work it, work on it as much. So a lot of my work went on this summer, and now this quarter is the first quarter that I am using the actual class. Uh, and how else to support OER? If any, if you if you're wondering, um, your instructional design team. I had a, a really supportive administration that said, "Run with it," and it and we will do anything we can to support you. Um, and grants do help that way. You know, you can possibly uh, teach a little less if you need. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, if I had to give one thing, my grants and definitely my instructional design team, thank you. Thank you so much. I have uh, Quill West and Zoe here at Pierce have been, some people know Quill. She's absolutely been amazing um, and completely supportive. Uh, they actually, if I have an idea, uh, for a, a test or a, an assessment, they're the, I, I'll let them know and I'll say, can you, can you look at this and tell me if this is realistic? Um, do, you know, do you understand it? Because one of the big things for me in um, how it kind of totally revamped how I teach is I had to kind of take a step back and go, okay, A, it's a survey course. So they don't need every intricate detail about, you know, the Puritans and things. Uh, and then I had to go back and look at stuff that I thought was amazing and I've done for years and go, this is a little unrealistic um, to expect students to do. And I had to revamp it so that it made, A, it, it was presented better and the students understood it better and it made sense. So I used to have them do this huge essay and read huge chunks of like John Locke's, Hobbes, Montesquieu, um, and a survey course. And then I have them write an essay. Well, that I totally shelved. I do we, do we still do that? But one of the things we spent, I spent time over the summer doing is putting together just chunks of Locke, Hobbes, Montesquieu, Rousseau, so that it reduced the reading. That was number one. And then we, instead of having an essay, we do a graphic organizer with a reflection. Um, that way it was, you know, it, I've already had a way better response with that assignment um, than I've had in previous 
classes. That worked out so much better. The students were, and I, and I gave them some context and said, this is what you're looking for. Um, and they, I've had the assignments came back. I just finished grading them and they were um, far better than any of the essays that I used to have them write. So that's a big piece of it too. Um, the one thing I wish, I gotta be honest, I wish I had, I wish I had more of my own faculty, history faculty, looking at it and weighing in on it, maybe adding, saying this is what, you know, we would add to it, just because it's, you know, just more minds on something sometimes can produce something even better than worth that I'm thinking of. So that's one thing I really wish uh, that more of the history faculty and maybe even English faculty would weigh in on some of what I'm doing um, with the writing component of my class. So uh, here are just a couple of resources. I do have links in here too. So if you have any questions, um, let me know. I have OpenStax is the main text for my class. That's the, the base book. Um, a, you can find, I, hopefully there's some, I'm sure people have seen this stuff before. Project Gutenberg is a place I get some of the primary source documents from, and they give very lengthy chunks of it. So you may have to like go in and try to figure out what pieces you want and you put them in a Word doc or pages. You can use pages, the pages feature in Canvas too. Um, and then digital history, that one is, I've, we found out that one, that one does have a license, but it has tons of primary source, source documents to it and I can link to it. And it's, a, it's pretty, it's gonna be there for a while. So um, that actually has been uh, a huge help. And it also takes chunks of primary source documents so that uh, my students aren't reading like, you know, 10, 15 million pages for uh, what, I, what I need to just give them a tiny snippet of something so they understand it. And my favorite thing, my favorite, favorite thing that we have found, that we found this year, Quill sent this to me, and it's the Interactive Constitution. And it is just an absolutely uh, fun way to look at it. And you, you know, when you go into it, instead of just having a document, it outlines all the Constitution, the entire thing, and then it has for each amendment, um, it has uh, the amendment and then several articles also along with it. So if you're, I am asking my students to do research, it already has some of their research sitting in it. So that, that right there is one of my probably um, favorite things that we've found so far. Uh, so th if you need, if you want to ask any questions about any of those, um, I'd be willing to answer uh, what I can on those. So benefits of it and things that I love about OER and why I'm hoping, hoping, hoping that I can have more time during maybe this summer. Um, it reduces prep time, and for me, that's huge. Uh, I've, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm kind of busy, so reducing prep time is absolutely amazing. Once, it's, once you get it done, once you get a whole class done, um, I have to go back and check links, um, and I have to go back and obviously add due dates to assessments and things like that, but I'm not sitting there scrambling around trying to find, you know, documents and books and, you know, quizzes and things that I used to use. It's all sitting there and the students are able to see it early in the quarter. That way there's no, there, you know, they have more time to look at it and process it and ask, ask questions. Um, easy access to, like I said, I, I have a filing cabinet full of stuff and, uh, you know, every quarter it was like, okay, what did I do with that assignment. Um, now I don't have to do that. The assessments are there, the projects are there, the rubrics align with the learning targets and objectives and they're all sitting there so that students know exactly what's expected to them. So it's really streamlined all of my grading. Um, and it's also better for the students. That way they're not sitting there worried about, you know, what if I lost my paper? What if I, you know, what if my computer's crashes I don't I ran out of ink I ran out of printer paper none of that's an issue it you know it's it always due prior to the class period um, also I've noticed already that their students are much more prepared for class if they have some sort of prep work and there's even a you know a small assessment with it an evidence and interpretation log they come in it's it's been done prior to the class and they're ready to go and I get much richer conversations about all of it. Uh, 
and the, the students are enjoying it and they greatly greatly appreciate not having to spend 150 bucks on a history book and they don't have to lug it around um so yeah and you, the one of the you know obviously one of the one of the things that some students say is i still like my printed text and I remind them that they can uh, they can print it very easily because we have ch the chapters are chunked out in my in my class so that all they have to do is go down and print it. And I just found out today we have 15 bucks, I guess, with the $15 each student gets $15 to print per quarter. So I mean that's if that's if that's an objection you hear from your students, and I, I get that sometimes people will go, but I want my students to have paper. I get that, I love books too, um, but they can, there is a printed option available usually at, at a much, 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 much reduced cost. Okay, um, well that's, uh, that's all I have, um, but yeah, if, you, if you're just even on the edge of, you know, thinking about using OER or a little nervous about what do I do if I, have everything online are they going to adjust it is a little bit of an adjustment and yeah it takes a little bit of training in, in your class to say things are due online before you come to class um, but it's well i would say it's well worth um, the time and energy and i can't uh going forward um i'm definitely one of the things i need to do i'll be honest i need to link more to some of my library resources they're free they're available and they're usually really good, like the PBS documentaries, those aren't going anywhere and we have a license for them. Um, and so that's definitely on the top of the list for, um, for, for next quarter as I start the you know, second round. I don't have any data necessarily because this is my first quarter, but um, using the complete OER class, but uh, yeah, we'll have to, I'll definitely check back in and let you know how things develop and uh, things I'm doing in the future. So thank you so much for allowing me to take the time and share. I, um, if you guys have any questions, I'll take those at the end. I think we're taking them at the end. Well, actually, I think what we'll, what we should thank you so much because that was that was um, amazing. Um, I think we do have at least one question uh, that came to me. Una, did you want to um, ask but, uh, the question you had about shells? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry to jump in. The, this is also we want the audience to ask some questions. We're we're running just a little bit ahead of schedule, so we're just going to take a couple of questions here. If you're okay with that, Laura. Oh yeah. And 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 of course we'll have um, much more time at the end. Um, you know, one thing that had been mentioned to me is that you use the Canvas Commons um, OpenStax shells. Yeah. Uh, to get started. And um, that's actually a really wonderful um, resource to share with other folks. And I don't know if you wanted to speak about how you found those. We also happen to have the person from California who uh, was leading that effort online. So oh, she can also uh, share. But um, did, was that helpful in terms of getting started? Oh yeah. I mean, because I, I like I said at first, I was like, am I writing a whole book here? I, I, did, I was like, I'm a little nervous about this. And so when I found that, I was like, oh, this is fantastic. And I did go, I mean, you've got to take the time and review the book and make sure, you know, you know what's in it and all of that. But then I was just able to add my kind of own spin to it with my primary source documents, our learning targets from peers, and then our, the assessments for each, kind of each chapter. And it comes built in with um, test banks. If you're like, but I need to make sure they do their reading. There's, we have, there are um, multiple choice, quick, like reading checks for each uh, chapter. So yeah, it was a big load off my shoulders when I found that. Great, wonderful. And, and Barbara Alowski has mentioned just to, to, for folks in other disciplines that there's actually 31 shells out there for the different areas. Um, and it's in the Canvas Commons, and I think Barbara's gonna share how to search for it, and she did that. Um, and they're doing the business shells now, which are the newest open textbooks out of OpenStack. So a really wonderful resource for faculty who wanna build a course around an OpenStax book. There's also, I think, a, a shell that will allow you to substitute um, the OpenStax textbook if you choose something that is, an, is from a different uh, organization. 
Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and it looks like we have one question in the chat here. Um, the question is, and feel free to um, answer if you would like, Laura. Um, it says, if you were doing this OER adoption for all your departments, including part-time faculty, how long of a lead time would you recommend from first decision to actually rolling out the OER in class? Oh my gosh. I mean, I. It took me most of the summer and then even when I, when I thought I was done um, I sent it to Quill and she you know wanted to make sure which is amazing gave me tons of feedback and so I had to go back and um, make sure you know what what are the learning targets look like um, is you know is how is it labeled so that it was easy to flow through so that there was a um, kind of uniformity to it so I mean it took me a couple, several months um, before it was done and then we could all kind of look back look at it and go yep this is good to go all right well thank you very much if there are any other questions please uh, feel free to type them into the chat window there I think we will probably have some additional time at the end uh, to address some questions I um, had at least one more that I wanted to ask but I'd like to get to Rudy here um, and dr. Rudy Navarro is I'm sorry, I better share my screen sorry um, Dr. Rudy Navarro is art history instructor at Phoenix College uh, here in the uh, Maricopa Community College District. And he's going to pass it over to him and he will share with you his experience. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you to everyone for having me today. I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about what's going on here in Maricopa. So I'm going to follow the same format that um, Laura was using. I'll talk a little bit about the challenges, the process of um, building the course. I have a little bit of data about how students think about the course and how it's affecting learning outcomes. And if I have time, I'll talk about um, how it's transforming my um, teaching practices. So um, in terms of the challenges, um, I'll reiterate what Laura was saying. Um, time is one of the biggest things. I usually, but when I design a course like this, usually budget about one and a half to two teaching courses, about the same amount of time it would take me to, to teach one and a half to two courses um, for designing the course. And it's gonna change, the course I'm gonna be showing you is an actually on the ground course, which I use Canvas as the supplemental materials for all my resources. But if you're doing it online completely, it's gonna be even a little bit more time because you're gonna have to add a, a quite a bit more material. So in terms of you know, budgeting your time or thinking about how, how much time it might take you to do this, you know, I use that one and a half to two uh, courses uh, teaching load for that. Um, the other big challenge for me, and Laura kind of alluded to this, was just understanding copyright. I've been doing this for a long time, and I've kind of um, always think, well, it's educational, I don't really have to, you know, to worry about this kind of stuff. And with art history, it's all about images. So, you know, finding images that are free, open use, you know, that can be kind of tough. So the textbooks are great for that, because all those images are already licensed for you to use. So it makes it a little bit complicated when you're doing like an image-based course like art history would be. Uh, I, uh, Maricopa uh, College, I'm sorry, Maricopa Community Colleges has a great uh, program called Maricopa Millions. Matthew Bloom works with them. They do a wonderful um, educational course for that, and I learned a lot about copyright and how to um, use copyright, how to assess for copyright and open licensing in my courses. But even then, um, you know, I take the course, I think I know everything about it, and the first week of trying to identify materials, I realize, you know, I don't really know how to apply this. And I came to a really quick rule. If the website or the source doesn't clearly list their licensing, uh, it doesn't, doesn't clearly list, list it as open source, whatever, I consider it off limits. I consider it as like completely licensed and I have to use it very sparingly. So I developed a kind of a hierarchy of sources. The first one, the, the, the golden sources are sort of the open uh, uh, materials, things that are clearly labeled as Creative Commons licenses for open use. Um, I know just a couple art historians are online right now. They might be familiar with things like Smart History or Khan Academy. Those are really excellent sources and they're all openly licensed, meaning I can download them, I can copy them, I can distribute them whoever I want to. Um, they're not gonna go away because they reside on my hard drive now. So those are great. Because as much of the course as possible that you can do with openly licensed material, the better. The second level were things that are clearly licensed. You know, not, they might not be open licensed, but they are licensed. And here I use my library a ton. Um, the library has a lot of e-resources. 
which are already licensed for student use. So you don't have to, you know, research, you have to like, you have to send emails to people, you already know it's available, and you can just link directly to that. And I'll show some examples of that coming up. And the last uh, hierarchy, the last sort of level of sources would be the unlicensed, I'm sorry, the um, licensed materials, uh, or things that I, I really don't know what they are. Um, you can always link to that stuff a YouTube video or someone's video on a website or something, you can always link to that. But as Laura mentioned, you don't know if it's gonna stick around. There's a permanency issue. I even have a, 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 a link right now on my course, it's just, it's just been going on for a semester, it's already dead because the link, you know, video's gone down. So I try to make those less than 10% of the course. Sometimes there's a really great thing you wanna include, but you really wanna make sure that you're not using a whole lot of those things. So once you figure out the copyright and how to use that copy of those licenses, um, the course goes really fast. Like I said, it took me about the first week um, to figure that kind of stuff out. And then the last thing, the last challenge, and this is actually the fun challenge for me, is curating. Again, those art historians out there might know what I'm talking about, but there are actually quite a few openly licensed or appropriately licensed sources for art history. Smart, uh, um, Smart History is one of them. The Metropolitan Museum of Art also has a great series of essays um, which are licensed, but you can still link to them pretty quickly. There's a source called Art Story, um, which again is licensed, so you can link to it. But again, there's quite a few um, sources. And the problem for me became, you know, what do I want to use? Um, what, of all these things available to me, just how do I want to use it? And what do I want to tell the students to, um, to use? Uh, some of the things to overcome the challenges, uh, as Laura mentioned already, money. Uh, Maricopa Millions, like I said, is a program here in the Community College District of Maricopa, and they essentially gave me money to teach a class, uh, and I was able to use that money to develop the course. Um, I wasn't able to uh, teach any less, but knowing that I was getting paid for this, you know, you have a little bit of responsibility, I'm getting a check, I probably should, you know, make sure I'm doing this, um, that really kind of helps uh, motivate you to make this happen. The other ways to approach some of these challenges, this gets into a little bit of my process now, is uh, your team, and Julie meant, or Laura, Laura mentioned her design team. We also have a, a great uh, a department here, Center for Teaching and Learning. You're seeing Julie Magadin, our instructional designer over there on the left, and I saw an instructional designer um, online as well. Um, Julie is great. Uh, I thought since you know, I'm starting this process, I might want to take a look at my course altogether. You know, how are my learning objectives? How is it laid out? What are my assignments like? Do they all uh, co uh, conform to the learning objectives? Do the assignments con or the activities conform to the learning objectives? So Julie sat down with me. She kind of uh, reviewed my course and we talked about it. And I was able to get a sort of framework for how I wanted to proceed with the open resources. Uh, Julie also um, is a great resource for all the different Web 2.0 applications out there, things that I might want to include. Um, for activities with uh, things like Padlet or um, Play, PlayPosit. Um, some of you might know these things. If not, um, head to your uh, CTL or your instructional designer um, for some of those resources. So she's also one of the ways that I was able to meet some of those challenges. She knows all this stuff. She worked very closely with me. And the other person who really deserves a lot of credit is Christine Moore, our one of our librarians here, our department chair in our library. Like I said, a lot of my resources come from the library, the um, e-resources they have, and that includes um, e-books, it includes journal articles, it includes a great collection of streaming videos. I use a lot of videos, and you'll see some of the student feedback on those videos later on, but I use a lot of videos in my course to engage the students, as well as to present some pretty cool information. Um, so that was the design aspect of it, um, and sort of the resources aspect of it. Um, the next thing I did was to actually start building the course. And like, this is part of the curation, based on my learning objectives, based on the course format I uh, sat down with Julie and decided on, I began to kind of fit things into the modules, into the courses. Now I kind of went a different route than Laura. I didn't go with a textbook. I just started pulling different materials, different formats, and then building my modules that way. I shot for about an hour to an hour and a half of reading video, you know, some of engagement with the students in addition to some sort of activity at the end of each module. Um, I'll show you an example of what the course looks like in just a second here. Um, I was able to build the pages, build the assignments, build the activities. And again, this is kind of the fun part, although it is very um, time consuming to do. The next thing was testing. I wanted to see what the students thought of it and also what, um, how the uh, course was affecting um, learning outcomes. So let me show you now how 
uh, the course looks, so I can show you what I was actually testing students for here. So this, we use Canvas as well. This is what one of our modules looks like. This is the week eight module on romanticism and realism. It's all laid out here. And just to give you an example of what uh, one of the activities would look like. Um, hey, sorry, Rudy. I'm not uh, seeing the, um, the Canvas happening. screen. Okay, let me do this real fast, sorry. There we go. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so here's one of the modules um, on romanticism. Here is a link to the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Hybrid Timeline of Art History. And this is one of those smart history modules I was talking about. I just copied and pasted this directly from the website. It's open source, I can do whatever I want with it there. Um, modules look like this. Another example, hopefully the video here, let's see. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so here's a series of videos again from um, uh, Smart History. This is a video that I would produce myself. So I did do a little bit of my own um, uh, work on this and my own video lectures um, to supplement or to uh, talk about certain points that I really wanted to get students to think, um, think about. So one of the ways I tested the course, let me go back to the module here, is in this week eight, I split it up into two parts, sorry. Here we go. So the first part was romanticism, and here I use all the open resource material I've been talking about. The second part was a section on realism, and for that case, I just photocopied the textbook chapters or section, and hopefully this is um, fair use, so hopefully a judge would think so, a very, very small portion of the textbook, but I let the students then kind of read the textbook, as I would usually have done before I did the open resource materials. Um, the other thing I did, and just to give you a sense of the assignments that I used, at the end of each week is a different activity to help students, you know, engage with the material to kind of process some of the stuff. So for example, in week eight, in the open resource course, I had students do photographs in the style of romanticism and realism. And I used a Web 2.0 um, application called Padlet. Some of you might be familiar with it. And I just have the students then post their photograph in the romantic or realist style to the Padlet. So people can see what they're doing. And then they'll first all describe a little bit about how exactly it complies with romanticism or realism. So this is the OER assignment. The previous textbook course, I would have the student read the chapter, and then reflect. They would give me a 250 word sort of essay on what they thought about the chapter. I would usually give a prompt, you know, or say, respond to this, and then they would just kind of write a reflection. And that's how it was happening um, uh, in the textbook course. So now, just to kind of show you, and I might have a problem with the sharing again here, but maybe not. I did a little formative assessment. And I asked students which version of uh, the materials they like best. Do they like the open resource version or do they like that textbook version, that copy of the textbook version? And you can see here, I had about 23 students <coughs> responding. Overwhelmingly, um, they like the um, OER format better, the mix of the videos and the readings. Um, they thought that the OER format kept their attention more and that they learned more from the OER format. It's a pretty um, overwhelming response there. They definitely liked um, the OER better. Um, one of the things I like about this little bit of brief research here is um, if the, the literature right now on uh, open resource effects on learning outcomes is just beginning. And a lot of it's focusing on learning outcomes, but it's not really telling us how students are learning or why they're learning better from OER materials. So this kind of information begins to get a little bit more of that kind of black box question. What's going inside, going on inside the black box? We're getting, a, I'm getting a little bit of sense here of what, what's making OER more effective for these students. 
Um, I did a little thematic analysis of the comments. I did ask them to um, comment on, you know, the responses. And uh, I broke some themes out here. One of the big themes was that videos uh, helped the students better. They seemed to learn more for a variety of reasons from the videos. A student said that. Uh, the mix of reading and video seemed to hold their attention more. Three students said that. Some people liked the fact that it was online. There was no textbook. They could just go online whenever they wanted to and you know, start doing their assignments. And others liked the shorter readings. Um, again, textbooks, as you're aware, you, know, you, you sign, sign a chapter, it's just you know, 20 pages of something. Here, the readings are much briefer, but there are more of them. So those shorter readings seem to help them focus a little bit better. The next assessment I did was I took a look at the on-time completion rates and the completion rates for those little end of module activities. For the textbook, it was that written reflection. And for the OER version of the course, it was, it was those, those other activities, like that Padlet activity. Some of the other activities I had them do might, might be a written reflection, it might be a quiz, it might be a discussion forum, it might be other artwork, um, but I kind of varied up a little bit. And as you can see here, there's quite a, quite a big difference. Uh, there was a 73% improvement in the number of assignments that were completed in the OER course versus the textbook course. That's a pretty big, pretty big significant change. And there was a 267% improvement on how many people submitted their stuff on time. Um, so clearly they seem to be engaging more, um, they seem to be more interested in actually doing the activities as opposed to just doing the readings. Um, and again, this is kind of getting at that what's going on in the black box. Why is OER affecting our learning outcomes, things like uh, passing grades or withdrawal rates and things like that? Well, this kind of tells us students are more engaged, they're actually doing the work, and they're doing it on time. So it gives a little bit better sense of that. Um, and I think finally, uh, in terms of how this has sort of transformed my teaching, uh, one of the things I learned from the OER, and this is something I've been working on you know, ever since I've been teaching, is varying my formats, varying my uh, presentations, varying my classroom instruction, um, trying to incorporate a lot of different activities. I like the idea that students, when they click on something in my OER course, they don't know what they're going to get. Is it going to be a reading? Is it going to be a quiz? Is it going to be an activity? Is it going to be a video? Um, that kind of anticipation that, you know, they're not bored by, by having to click on different things. Same thing in my classroom. I use that in OER, but I also use it in the room. You know, I vary my lectures with um, uh, student guided reading, with video watching, with art projects. Um, students design their own activities sometimes. They work in their groups. Um, they might be writing activities. There's all kinds of things they actually would do in the classroom as well. Uh, so the stuff I learned in developing the OER course also uh, helps me just in the classroom in general, kind of transforming the way I teach and present material. With well, that, I'll end. Are there any questions? Well, all right. Thank you very much, Rudy. Um, and there is one question in there. Um, Apurva Ashok is asking if you uh, sent a survey out to your students. Um, did they fill out a survey? And if so, would you be comfortable sharing it? Because uh, it may be valuable for others to see, if not um, adapt for their own purposes. Yeah, you mean the actual um, the survey form itself or the results of the survey? I think, well, I think, the, yeah, the, yeah, the survey form. Yeah, I have no problem doing that. It was just a, a quick, I don't sure, you want to take the screen back? Um, oh, yeah, I'll take it. I'm not sure if, um, yeah, I'm more than happy to share it. It was just a little, a little survey in Canvas at the end of the module. I just had them fill it out. Um, but sure, I'd be more than happy to share that with you all. Okay. So, Rudy, if you can unshare your screen, oh, I'll I'm go sorry. ahead and take over. It's okay. <laughs> Um, there were, I, uh, first of all, I want to um, open this up. We've got about 15 minutes left um, for uh, questions, and we can certainly use it up if we need. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to uh, chime in or to just simply, oops, that's not what I meant to do, or just to simply um, uh, put them in the chat window there. I did have a couple of follow up questions. Um, one of them, I think both Rudy and um, Laura, I think you both touched on this idea that the, the process of of adapting or adopting open educational resources or developing the content even uh, to some extent from scratch. Uh, you both kind of touched on that as um, as a process that's a really great opportunity for self-assessment, you know, looking at your teaching and, and um, identifying maybe 
you know, some components that you'd been including that you didn't actually really need in the end, or maybe kind of focusing things in. Um, and I, I certainly, I've, I've read other experiences about that, and I've had that same experience myself. I was wondering if one or both of you would be willing just to elaborate a little bit more on um, what specifically you felt adopting the OER helped you to change and improve about your teaching. Go ahead, Laura, if you have something. Um, gosh, well, some of it I was attached to, I had to read in, you know, I had to read some of it. And so I thought, well, so should they. Um, and so I, I thought I had, to, I mean, I was having them read huge chunks of stuff and it, and I, and if you know anything about like reading apprenticeship and how, um, language acquisition, I started looking at that stuff and going, uh, I, you know, I'm overloading my students a bit here. Uh, and also are they just Googling it? are they i mean let's get real are they just googling it or are they really reading it and so that was my big thing i i had to scrap a couple of things and go i can give them a smaller chunk and ask for a like rudy talked about a quick reflection and that i mean they that hits the learning objective and so just keeping students keeping their well-being and what's best for them in mind constantly and, and asking yourself, that's part of doing the whole OER, you know, adoption thing is, are they, you know, are they really doing it? Some of the research that came out of Tacoma Community College indicated that students went by the text and then they would just Google anything they needed to know. And so we want them to engage in our content and not, you know, not Google or any of those things. So that, I mean, I really, it changed a lot of, of how I go about, you know, looking at assignments and assessments. So I don't know about Rudy. Yeah, I would um, echo that. There's a lot of stuff in the textbook, and it's been bugging me for us. And the textbooks are great, but there's so much in those textbooks, especially our history, which I don't talk about in class. Um, I probably cover maybe 20% of what goes on in a chapter in my class. And the students are like, they're make, uh, making them read this stuff and they're thinking, why am I reading this if he's not gonna be talking about it? And of course, there's a lot of learning that goes on on their own. I'm not saying that's what happened. But with the OER, I was able to really focus. You know, this is what I want, this is what I think, this is the skill I think students need to know. These are the concepts I think they need to know to understand our history and the discipline of our history. And I, I can put away some of that other nice to know stuff and really focus on the skills and the concepts I really want them to be able to grasp and to master. Well, thank you very much. That's really great response. I um, see we've got a number of different comments and questions in the chat over here, and I just wanted to um, shout out a couple of them. So first one that I saw in here, uh, it said, Rudy or anyone, this is from Bonnie Ashmore, do you have any recommendations for good low-cost, no-cost textbooks for art survey classes or art appreciation? Um, it, if you have a quick answer to that, Rudy, feel free to respond. If not, I'm sure we can probably call out to the community for that, but do you know of any, Rudy? Uh I did a ton of um, scanning when I was beginning this. I'll be more than happy to share my bookmarks with you because they're all in the bookmarks and stuff. Um, like I said, I saw a lot of those sources and I decided to go a little bit different, kind of like do the little module uh, bits and pu puzzle approach versus the textbook. But I'm more than happy to um, share my, my own bookmarks and the sources that I found. Great. Um, there's also another question that's directed at both um, for, for both Rudy and Laura. Um, this is from Tina Ulrich, and she says, "What are faculty who are teaching the same course at your college using? So, uh, like, what are the what, what's the comparable material? Textbooks. That's what oh. they're using at my class. Uh, yeah, that's they. Yeah, most of the history faculty use uh, the textbook. So there's no, you know, they might have pri some primary source documents, but most of them have a textbook." And is it an expensive textbook? Just out of curiosity. Uh, yeah, um, the uh, let's see, I want to say it's like a hundred and like thirty dollars. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Rudy, do you have any idea? Anyone? Uh, are, is who? What? What are the other materials that the other instructors that teach the course use? Do you know? Uh, textbooks. Yeah, ex exactly. I, I, I'm not saying they only use. I'm not sure what how else they supplement. You know, the textbooks right. stuff. I'm sure things they do other things, but 
Yes, mostly textbook. Well, I think both of you also touched on this idea that when you when you when you go to the open resources, you know, you are um, you're bringing in like new kinds of activities, new kinds of you know a variety of media. Um, and one of the questions that I had, um, and this. I guess this is for both of you, but I know Laura specifically, I think Rudy, you also mentioned this, you know, you, you're using new assignments. And Rudy, you mentioned using Padlet, right? Instead of doing a reflection. So you kind of have students doing something that's slightly different in terms of uh, the creation. Laura, I was wondering what uh, new assignments were you employing instead of essays? I'm, uh, I have a couple of discussion boards where actually it would be great to have an art history person weigh in. I have a, a picture from colonial America that depicts, you know, the colonists beating up some red coats and then the students are uh, taking their readings and that picture and saying, you know, is this, was it a, a valid rebellion? Was it rebellion or was it patriotism? And they have to kind of discuss back and forth. So it's fun stuff like that. So it's not always write me a paper you know, take a multiple choice exam. It's, it kind of adds a little more, I think, fun content and material. So it's not your typical five page essay. Excellent. Um, so, and another thing that you had mentioned was uh, involving the students in creating content as well. Um, yeah. And I thought that that was really interesting. Um, I, I believe you said that, you know, if they, the, the agreement was if they did a really good job, then you're going to be able to use it, right? So yeah. um, my question is, and I love it, it's, it, you know, brings to mind this idea of open pedagogy, really getting students involved in that creation of knowledge. Um, how did you, or, or, or did you consciously go about um, discussing licensing with your students? Um, Not when yet. You did that? Okay. If, uh, if, if, we, if we find, like, if me and obviously I'll let Quill look at it too, if we find something that's really extraordinary and we're like, oh, we have to have this, we need to share it, um, then we'll definitely make sure we talk about that with the student and how that works. But yeah. Okay. Like that's a that's yeah that's something that we're trying this quarter to see uh, if you know we we may see if we can produce a couple of good things that other teachers might use and may want to use. I don't know. Cool. Well, I have one final question. I if um uh, we're we've got about five minutes left. Um, I guess maybe I I won't ask my question, but I I don't know. I kind of want to. It's a provocative one. The question is, was the money enough? <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to answer that. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next thing. So, um, no, so thank you very much, uh, Rudy and, and Laura, for all that. So, um, please, th this is thank you for joining us today. Uh, there's just a couple of. Um, little notes here that we want to say. We have some um, upcoming conferences. If you want to go to our website, go to the Get Involved section and go take a look at it. We have our community email. Um, absolutely a wonderful resource. Um, a lot of stuff comes through there and it's, it's actually pretty amazing the uh, the contributions that we get from the community in terms of sharing resources and asking questions. Um, also, just a reminder about Open Education Week. Um, this is that annual opportunity. This is uh, sponsored by the Open Education Consortium, or organized, I guess, by them. Um, and it's the annual opportunity to really celebrate the work that your uh, faculty are doing for students in terms of um, open educational resources and open pedagogy. And so, of course, we don't want to just relegate that to just one. So one week a year, but it is a really, really good opportunity to kind of um, synergize all this uh, things happening across the world. And just as a reminder, we have uh, our spring webinar series. This is the first of just a few things we have here. Um, First of all, we've got the Open Ed Week uh, Faculty Dialogues. It's like a mini webinar series. We're going to have, um, you know, facu each day there's going to be a couple of faculty in a certain discipline discussing the kind of intricacies of using OER relevant to that discipline. Uh, we thought that that would be interesting, not only for faculty in those individual disciplines, but also for others who um, may be teaching a different discipline, but 
you know, still could maybe think like, oh, that's interesting that that's something that, that you're experiencing there that I don't or whatever, you know. So we thought it would be interesting dialogues to have. And we are encouraging people, if you are interested in participating in that as somebody, or if you have some ideas about that, you can see the link right there. There's a, there's a sign up. Uh, it goes to a, a Google form, I believe. And um, we are looking for people to participate in that right now. We haven't chosen the disciplines at this point uh, because we wanted to leave that up to the community. There's also also, uh, April 3rd, the OER Connection with Dual Enrollment. Following uh, in May, we've got OER and Zero Textbook Cost Degree Pathways as the topic for our webinar. And then finally in June, it's going to be Regional Models for OER Implementation. Um, and you can see everything you need down here at the registration page. And if you have additional questions about everything, uh, apparently, don't contact me because I'm not on here. No, contact these are your uh, these are your folks here uh, at the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. And once again, I'm Matthew Bloom, and I am just thanking you again for participating. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat window. Um, and have a wonderful afternoon.